So this is our second talk. Yesterday mm. we, we talked about the history of light, the entire history of light. Um, well, at least 400 years of it. Mm -hmm. um, and today we're going to talk about different types of light. Mm. So. so different parts of the spectrum. But first of all, like, we call this the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, That's why, right. why electromagnetic? Because we're not talking about electricity or magnetism. Or we, or we really, we're talking about light, photons. That's right. Yeah. So the electromagnetic spectrum is essentially the sum of all the light in the universe. Mm. Um, and the name itself is a little bit obscure. I find it a little bit mm. opaque. Um, the reason it's called that is because the person who did, who coined that term and who did, in fact, most of the research in this area, or at least certainly wrote down most of the laws to do with electromag the electromagnetic spectrum, is James Clark Maxwell. Mm. He's um, a major a great scientist, yeah, 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 yeah. Scottish. Um, mm. uh, so James Clark, Clark Maxwell spent most of his life studying properties of electric, electrical and magnetic magnetic fields, um, mm. Mm. and he realized that in actual fact um, light, electricity and magnetism are part of the same phenomenon, they're the same thing, they all mm. work together. In so fact, it's like the unification of three different That's right, yeah. exactly, yeah. they're the same thing mm. essentially. Mm. Uh, uh, a photon of light, and we discussed yesterday what a photon is, it's a little packet of energy essentially, and mm. um, it moves forward and as it does... Or At a very, very great speed. Exactly. Which is always the same. Yeah. And as it does, yeah. it generates oscillating electrical and magnetic fields. Mm. And these are at right angles to each other, essentially. Mm. So bundles of energy mm. generating mm. electrical and magnetic fields. That's what light So it was Maxwell who discovered this. That's right. right. And Maxwell was, I mean, I know when Einstein went to Cambridge, because Maxwell was a, was a, was a professor at Cambridge, and they, they said to him, here you are walking in the footsteps of Newton. But he said, yeah, yeah. Oh, more importantly, I'm walking in the footsteps of Maxwell. Uh, yeah. uh, and he considered that Maxwell was, was, was the most important scientist uh, who, 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 okay. on which his work was based. Uh, mm. uh, so Maxwell was a giant, really. Uh, uh, and yet, and yet he's, not a, he's not a household mm -hmm. name the way mm -hmm. Einstein and Newton would be. No, I think he yeah. was a very retiring mm. fellow, actually. Mm. You know, I mean, he, 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 he wrote his equations, they're called Maxwell's equations, um, in two volumes, there's a dynamical theory of the electromagnetic field, which he published in 1865, and then his treatise on electricity and magnetism in 1873, and they are the foundations, essentially, of, of modern physics. Mm. But um, and, uh, In fact, um, uh, uh, somebody said to me recently, if if nine, late 19th century scientists had read them more carefully, they would have come up with, uh, with uh, relativity much, much sooner. Okay, yeah, okay. So. He was a, apparently a very awkward fellow and very, very retiring. Mm. Um, he was in Cambridge, was he? Cambridge, yeah. Cambridge. But he's Scottish. Yeah. Scottish, but he yeah. didn't, you know, he wasn't out and about a lot, in fact. He was extremely mm. retiring and he was also a poet. Mm. Um, he wrote um, a lot of poetry and one, which I will not read because it's extremely long and slightly depressing, which I find, <laughs> I love the title. It's, it's lines written under the conviction that it is, it is not wise to read mathematics in November after one's fire is out. Mm. I read that at dinner to the family. <laughs> uh, last week and everybody's eyes glazed over mm. but he wrote another beautiful the one that really describes um, electromagnetism it, it goes in a Scottish accent which I don't I can't do at all perhaps you Go should on. read it you'll be better me. I'm not Scottish. A Scottish accent gain a body meet a body fly him through the air gain a body hit a body will it fly and where is Amazing. That, is that good? <laughs> <laughs> Which is all about electrons being released, I think, when one body or one photon hits. Anyway, so we owe the name electromagnetic spectrum to, uh, to this great uh, Scottish physicist, That's Maxwell. Right. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, uh, we're going to start by talking about um, the, the part of the spectrum uh, that, that is invisible. Uh, uh, which is most of the spectrum, and we're going to. And one particular part became visible to us uh, in the late nineteenth century, uh, before all the others, really. Uh, and uh, we call that part X-rays. August fourteenth. Notes on experiment designated X. Experimental subject: myself, James Xavier. X 
the most fantastic experiment you have ever taken part in, presents Ray Moland in his most challenging role since his Academy Award winning Lost Weekend. X, the man with the X-ray eyes. Are you all right? It's like a splitting of the world. More light than I've ever seen. Filled with light. Okay. Yeah. Why would we call them X-rays? Well, that's a long story. Mm. So, X-rays were discovered by William Röntgen mm. in 1901. Like um, he's German, or? German. Actually, no, he discovered them in 1895 and he received his Nobel Prize in 1901. Mm. Um, okay, so it was the late 19th century. That's right, yeah, that's yeah, right, yeah. yeah. And so uh, William Röntgen um, was uh, doing something that a lot of scientists were doing at the time. He was playing around with a Crookes tube. Mm. Um, yeah, they, they all, was a, that was a very a favorite scientific if, toy of the late nineteenth century. You really associate this image with the 19, late nineteenth century. They're beautiful version. things. Yeah. I yeah. adore them. Yeah. Um, yeah. So essentially, what a Crookes tube is is it's it's a glass bulb, mm. and it has um, two electrodes, one on one on one end, which is um, a cathode. So, so cathode you often is call it, you often call it a cathode tube. In fact, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. It's called yeah. a cathode tube as mm. well. Mm. I mean, Crookes tube is only one type of cathode mm. tube. Okay. So it has an a cathode on one end, which is a negatively charged el electrode. Um, negatively charged meaning it has too many electrons and it's lacking protons. Mm -hmm. um, and on the other side, there's an anode, which is the opposite. This is positively charged, so it doesn't have enough electrons. Too many protons. Too many protons. Mm. <laughs> so, so between those, there, you know, there's an imbalance. And mm. in this tube, there's it's a semi vacuum. Okay, so that helps things to move about. Mm -hmm. But if you just leave it like that, nothing happens. You don't get any type of, of change. But if you apply um, a high voltage to the cathode, that incites the cathode to release its electrons, and those electrons go flying down the tube. To the anode, right? So, so it's making, like a form of electricity. Yeah, but, current essentially but, but a discharge. But there's more than just electricity going on. Now, when uh, the electrodes arrive at the end and they hit the anode, mm. energy is released, and they could tell that, that something was happening because they could, you know, in the dark, sometimes you've got this strange green light, mm -hmm. so a sort of fluorescent thing going on. Yeah, so, and you can see the, the the projection of the cross at the end. That's a cross that's in yeah. the anode, in fact, isn't it? Or just beyond, just on this that's side right. of the anode. That's right. He was yeah. using that to, yeah. you know, as it, to make a shadow, so they actually mm -hmm. you could see that there was some, yeah, you know, magnetism or some some uh, radiation. Some radiation being projected. Yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah. there's a ray. That's ray. right. Yeah. 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 So Rotchen yeah. was was playing around with one of these, um, and he in his in his laboratory he had other stuff there, you know. So he had also. A screen for another application, and this screen was coated with a compound, a barium platinocyanide. So that is oh, so it's a like a like a like a like a photographic uh, exactly negative so like something a like that. Work. Yeah, yeah. So, so he obviously yeah. was going to do some type of yeah. you know sort of ph photographic work with this mm -hmm. barium platinocyanide screen. Right. Um, and um, as you, as one does. Uh, yeah, yeah a scientist <laughs> at the end of the twentieth century, nineteenth century. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, so um, he was doing this one day, and he obviously placed his body between uh, the cathode tube and, and the, screen. the screen. And next thing he saw, his like skeleton, an image of a skeleton appearing, which that, must have given him a terrible fright. That must have been terrifying. Yeah. 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 So, um, because of course, at the time, skeletons were death. Weren't they really? You never saw a skeleton yeah. unless you were in a cemetery uh -huh. or in yeah. in the catacombs. Yeah. So um, uh, so he must have got a terrible fright. But anyway. Um, he didn't tell anybody. He just kind of shut himself up for mm. several weeks to work that out and see what was going on. And he didn't want to tell people because they thought he would, you know, his reputation would be, would be at stake. They would think he was crazy. Mm. Um, and so several weeks later, he did a lot of different experiments with that and finally realized that you could actually expose a photographic plate using these, these, uh, this ray, these rays. Mm. And so he invited his wife to come around. Um, or maybe maybe she came around to find him. I don't know. After and, six um, weeks, I six think weeks so. later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, yeah, and I have the image here. Yeah, so she yeah. placed her yeah. hand between yeah. the cat, the the tube, the discharge tube, and and the and photographic, the photographic plate. plate, and they made this very mm. first radiograph photograph. Yeah. So this is actually the first, and you can see her ring there. That's her wedding 
finger, isn't it? Yeah. So, that so was this Peter. is Anna Bertha yeah. Malkin. Yeah. Um, this is her her hand and mm. her wedding ring. And um, in fact, she, she, she declared, I've seen my own death, which mm. is, of course, understandable because you never... Which is, yeah, that's what you associate images of bones with, mm. yeah, 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 yeah. But in fact, I mean, it, it shows you just how dynamic, uh, uh, how dynamic uh, the late 19th century um, uh, scientific mm. world was, that within a, a few years, wasn't it, you know, everybody seemed to be working with x-rays. Absolutely. Uh, by the way, we never really said why are they called x-rays oh yes okay so he didn't name them he just called what he called them he said oh i don't know what i'm gonna call these for mm. the moment i'll just call it x mm. and so it's like unknown start. unknown rays yeah. that's it yeah. exactly yeah. okay yeah so when we call them x-rays mm. we're still calling them by by the kind of the the unknown yeah. title yeah. The, uh, the x marks the spot that's yeah. it exactly yeah. Yeah. So the thing with x-rays is, of course, they can pass through matter. Not all matter, not mm. very, very dense matter. So they don't pass through bone, but mm. they will pass through softer matter like flesh or cloth or, you know, various other mm. food as well. Less dense tissue. tissue. That's right, yeah. that's right. Yeah. And um, yeah. it's, it's what we call ionizing, ionizing radiation. So ionizing meaning it will uh, knock an electron off. Of an oh, atom, right, right, uh, which is dangerous, so, of course, which yeah. can cause you know problems because mm. the, that electron is going to be well, that that cell or that atom is going to be you know lacking an electron, so it's going to want to hang on to you know to join up with that stuff and yeah, alliance with some other, yeah. Whatever. yeah, okay. okay. So these early researchers were looking at in this in this photograph. They would they wouldn't they would have been uh, they wouldn't have been aware of uh, any of these dangers, would they? No, yeah. no. And yeah. um, quite soon, though, though, they started to observe that you know people were getting burns and mm. things like that. Um, you know, I, I think actually they it really be, became an issue in about around about 90 or, 1904 in mm. the scientific community. Um, Thomas Edison's assistants. Clarence Daly died of skin cancer and oh that God. made a big shock to that person who was a very young person yeah, yeah. Um, and you know then other other uh, researchers were reporting burns and some of them were developing skin cancer and things like that so they became quite aware and then so within the scientific community they would protect themselves but in 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 the the wider public I uh, you know um, uh, things using uh, um, x-rays were quite widely available in a, um, right up to the 1950s in the United States, they had, um, a f I think, called a shoe fitting fluoroscope. A shoe fitting fluoroscope. Yeah. Okay. I mean, so you go into a shoe shop and you would stand in 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 this box and yeah. you know your feet would be X-rayed. Yeah. And then they could tell what shoes would suit you best. Okay. Well. Of course, the poor, poor uh, shop yeah, assistants. Yeah. I suppose mm. well, if you just do it once, it's fine. But every day, yeah, shop assistants, yeah, yeah, indeed. yeah. yeah. Yeah, but essentially the imagery that we look at when we look at uh, X-rays is, uh, and we're used, we're all so used to looking at this imagery, and it's been well established in our culture. This image of white bones, uh, grey flesh, and then uh, and then black background. That's right. Really, Which yeah, of course yeah. is a negative because mm. because in fact what happens with an X-ray is you're getting a shadow. You know, mm. you're sending a type of light. Um, towards a body mm. and that's passing through the softer tissue and been stopped by the hard and is stopped by the more dense materials. by the more dense yeah, ones yeah, so yeah. it's actually a shadow so, so that so the, the the bone the bone should be black and the uh, and the, the and the air around the, the limbs should be this should is be white negative. Yeah, 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 yeah 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 so this is an and we've got used to always looking at negatives uh, but these are incredibly yeah. beautiful mm. things you know I mean the, yeah. the, the, the delicacy of, of, mm. of a good uh, X-ray mm. photograph is just mm. stunning, and of um, course there's still be you know the just as the very first image was there's still basically black and white photography aren't there really as well. Uh, that's and, the, and you know when you look at your X-ray, at least traditionally when you, it was always on a film, which is essentially the negative really, isn't it? So yeah. with regard to art and and, mm. and culture, you know what are the applications mm. of X-rays in art and culture? Mm. Well, it's it's it. Despite the fact that it's such an old invisible light that's been revealed to us for such a long time, it hasn't it hasn't penetrated so much into uh, into into visual art. Very few. I mean, there's some excellent examples of artists it's, who do, but uh, it's used in conservation mm, a lot. Art mm -hmm, conservation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've recently they've, they've discovered a Picasso uh, which which has uh, underpainted uh, the, and the X-rays reveal uh, an underpainted uh, uh, Picasso. This uh, is image. a crouching beggar from from Picasso's Blue period. Mm -hmm. 
and you can see that it's painted over a landscape mm -hmm. which is is turned on its side yeah so speaking um, of landscape that is one thing you know within the limits of uh, we think think of it as photography black and white photography as i said but uh, you can't take landscapes can you on the other so side? if you can then how do they take those big um x-ray images of of trucks mm. trucks going through security they've got to, they've got to have a, a capturing surface on David, one a side. very very yeah. big capturing surface then i guess i guess yeah oh yeah. wow it's because you've always got to have uh, an x-ray source on the one side of the object uh, and, uh, and a capturing surface. Interesting thing, you know, before we finish on x-rays, mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's, it is, we think, the oldest invisible light uh, mm -hmm. that's, that, that has been integrated into our culture and we're all so well used to x-rays and uh, medical and uh, security x-rays, but culturally, um, what can we say? Well, but, certainly in, in science fiction cinema, mm -hmm. The man with the x-ray eyes tries to help the most desperate in our society and enjoys all the delights of secretly studying sexology. Headache? No, it's just my eyes. And, and comic books, I mean, I think so many teenage boys were very, very you know, influenced and introduced to science, I suppose, through X-ray vision. To the idea of X-ray vision, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. The idea of having uh, the, that whole idea of transparency, really. X, the most fantastic experiment you have ever taken part in. Pres and in a way, uh, uh, we're going to pass on to talking about now um, uh, uh, another form of uh, radiation that's much more obscure which is gamma radiation. Which has uh, also been very popular mm, in science fiction. Mm. Much more recently though, because of uh, in fact, particularly comic books, um, Marvel comics, uh, they, uh, they, uh, I think in the Incredible Hulk, mm, and they have Fantastic the Four, their, their, their powers came from uh, ah, gamma rays. Gamma. And of course, this, they would have been invented and during... Spider-Man? No. No, I don't think Spider-Man, mm. mm, perhaps. Some sort of radiation mm. about the Spider-Man. But, yeah. uh, um, uh, but in any case, you know, this would have been the time when uh, 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 right in the middle of the nuclear age, when America was doing uh, enormous amounts of um, of nuclear tests in the Utah mm. desert, okay. and of course these these tests were producing uh, enormous amounts of gamma rays. Uh, so when did we discover gamma then? Mm. So in fact, uh, uh, gamma would also have been discovered around about the turn of the century, uh -huh. even though it remains much more obscure, uh, by a Frenchman. Uh, who was a friend of yeah. the Curies. Uh, oh, that's right, yeah, yeah. Paul, yeah. Paul Viard, yeah, yeah. French yeah. chemist. So Paul Viard is relatively obscure, isn't he? Discovered gamma in 1900. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So, so he, would have, he would have been a friend of the Curies. Um, that's right. Uh, he, borrowed a, uh, he borrowed a sample of radium from the Curies. As one too. does. Yeah, yeah, as you do. Yeah. yeah. yeah if you're friends. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> so he borrowed the sample of radium and he also had a Crookes tube. Mm. Um, and so, or something a little bit like a Crookes tube anyway. Mm. Um, and he placed his radium in this tube and um, he surrounded it by lead mm -hmm. and leaving a gap so that he could, he could generate his stream of, of radiation, mm -hmm. which he did using, I, I believe, um, high voltage once mm -hmm. again. Um, and uh, he wanted to absor observe the radiation that came, came out of this. Out of the radiation. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. first of all, in order to, um, he put a photographic plate and he screened it with aluminium. Mm -hmm. So that would stop. Um, alpha. Alpha mm. was really not penetrating at all, even a, even so even a piece of even piece a sheet of paper would stop that. A sheet of paper yeah. would yeah. stop it. Yeah. 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 So he put a sheet of aluminium that would stop the al alpha. So that could have been even like a, a sheet of tin foil uh, kitchen paper. Uh, yeah. 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 Anything yeah. really. Mm -hmm. And then he put um, uh, a magnetic field. He applied a magnetic field to the whole um, arrangement, and um, because he he knew and they'd already discovered that um, a magnetic field would deviate. Um, a flow of beta rays, mm. so which are beta electrons. Uh, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm. That's what they are. And so, but then he saw that that nevertheless his um, his photographic plate had some impact, was exposed. Mm -hmm. So he knew he discovered. Well, he realized there's some other radiation. He didn't know what it was actually. Mm -hmm. So, um, but he, he certainly wrote it down and described it very very well. And a couple of years later, it was named by. Um, uh, by Ernest Rutherford. Ernest Rutherford was the, fa uh, the, the father of nuclear physics, mm. essentially. And he was studying all well, sorts of forms of nuclear radiation. That's right. Yeah. Where's yeah. he from, yeah. Rutherford? He was from New Zealand, oh, but he, right. he worked in, in Britain. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah. In okay. Cambridge, I think, as well. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So Rutherford yeah. um, had already named alpha and beta, so he, mm. he named this new radiation gamma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, village was so it's really interesting, a, you know, it's a nuclear radiation, uh, one of the alpha and beta and gamma, but it's also uh, a photon. It's also uh, part of the electromagnetic spectrum, mm. which the other two are not. Uh, uh, and, it, and it shares a lot of characteristics with X-rays. It's also used to look through things, but it, because it's shorter wavelength okay. and more, en more energy, it can get through much thicker plates of material. So this is an interesting image. So this is, is looking looking at a at a, a truck essentially a, a freight truck and we can see two figures in there. Mm. So this is a gamma image, a gamma X, well gamma radiography of a, of, of a truck in order mm -hmm. to um, to find migrants or chase mm -hmm. them down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it's a very dangerous uh, race as well. It's yeah, not something I mean, that should be legal at all. You know, I, I, yeah. I read, but in, in nine, uh, well, 2016, mm -hmm. uh, Britain was forbidden at Calais to use this technology anymore. Mm -hmm. um, that the French authorities wrote to them and told them that you can't do this because um, you're you're going against the human rights of the people. And in fact, to do it, you ought to really get get permission from every written mm -hmm. permission in order to allow you to do it, which they couldn't do, obviously, since they don't right. know they're there. Right. Right. So. Um, yeah. And of course, more recently, it's used in nuclear medicine, isn't it? Really, the the radio radioactive isotopes injected into your mm. body, which then got absorbed by certain uh, by certain um, tissues in your body, yeah. including cancer cells, yeah. uh, and they these then can be picked up by uh, by a PET scanner. And the PET scan, this PET scan essentially sees uh, so gamma this radiation. So again, a little bit like yeah. X-rays, allows us to see into the human body, mm. but in yeah. a slightly different way. Yeah. So a PET scan is like a like a uh, like an X-ray image. It's much lower resolution, but you see a different thing than, than what a what a. And so what what it does is, uh, I suppose the tumor will 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 pick up and store. The tumor the tends radio. to absorb the uh, this mm. particular radioactive isotope, mm -hmm. and you, so you can see in this image that the the liver has picked up a lot of the uh, of the of the radioactive isotope. So the, the main image you see is the liver. You can see some of it has gone down into the, the bladder. Mm -hmm. And then you can also see uh, the cancerous tumours in okay. the stomach. Okay. And you can also see the brain. The brain picks up a lot of it as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I guess this is dangerous. But, but people used to people, drink yeah. it, you know. I mean, yeah. they would, mm. uh, you know, before the war, the, the Second World War, people, there was medicines. Mm. There was one called Radithor, which is a patent medicine. And it contained one microcurie of each of radium-226 and 228 isotopes. Right. So and Is people that buy that. I think yeah. it's quite yeah. dangerous, yeah. Mm. Wow. So people would buy it and, and mm. you know, drink it for their health. So, so yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so beyond that, um, and, and for our show, for our show in the Crawford that's gonna go to um, Dubai afterwards, hopefully. Um, we we've been looking at what you, this is the most difficult one because because what can you do uh, uh, with uh, with gamma rays? Uh, we began looking around us of what uh, what exactly would 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 be producing gamma rays in our everyday environment, and we discovered bananas. Bananas. Uh, bananas. Brazil nuts. Brazil nuts. Which are my yeah. favorite nuts. Mm -hmm. um, uh, potassium salts, mm -hmm. if you, you mm -hmm. are, are watching mm -hmm. your diet and not taking too much sodium. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that's about, it, that, that's about it really, isn't it? Maybe your smoke detector as well. Well, there something. are a lot of things mm -hmm. that you mm -hmm. find that date. I mean, if you're mm -hmm. into antiques or bric-a-brac or, you know, sort of things that you might pick up in a flea market, mm -hmm. a lot of that stuff could be radioactive as this well. There's fiesta plates, isn't it? Fiesta yeah. wear, it's so a very, very bright colour. The plates with the glaze, which is made with uranium because it gives you a very bright mm. orange uranium. That's yeah. right, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, uranium glass, mm. Mm. Uh, which is like slightly green tinted glass, you, can, mm -hmm. you often get um, like sweet dishes and things like that or vases mm -hmm. at the flea market in the mm -hmm. green tinted glass, well it's mm -hmm. radioactive. And then of course there's clock faces. Clock uh, faces. Which, yeah, yeah. An interesting story uh, that you know we, we spoke about gamma rays uh, coming from the nuclear age uh, and right in the, mid in the middle of what we would now call the nuclear age um, uh, during the Cold War, uh, the Americans and the Soviets signed uh, a treaty to end nuclear testing. Mm -hmm. And very soon after that, uh, the Americans put into space a series of satellites which were put up there to detect gamma radiation coming from the Earth. Uh, mm -hmm. Which would, and that gamma radiation was would be the signatures of 
of illegal oh, uh, nuclear see. testing that the that the Soviets might be doing, mm -hmm. and presumably they also had ideas of using these satellites in nuclear warfare. Uh, but uh, but but in any, in any case, to start with, they were about detecting uh, signatures of uh, nuclear tests in gam from gamma ray bursts from the Earth, uh, and they didn't detect any, but they did detect some gamma ray bursts which were coming from the wrong direction. They were oh, coming. They were wow. coming from outer space. Outer space. Yeah, yeah, and of course. This is the military. They weren't interested at all. That they were they were involved in a war in a cold war. Uh, what came from outer space was somebody else's business. Mm, okay. So for a long time, these uh, these just remained a mystery. Finally, much more recently, uh, uh, the Fermi gamma ray space telescope was put into space uh, as an observatory of gamma events in space, mm. and they they began to unwrap the mystery around these gamma ray bursts. It seemed they were coming from uh, other other galaxies from quite far away, oh, wow. which was Ooh. which is which is good news because mm. they're very powerful. The yeah, most, the most powerful events. Uh, we'd be, uh, electron we'd be anni magnetic. annihilated, I suppose, if one happened close by. Apparently, we would be. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so these are these are signatures of black holes uh, forming, uh, or of neutron stars collapsing into black holes, uh, uh, which so are events that happen. The end of a star, essentially. Mm -hmm. The end uh, of the a star. The collapse of a star into wow. a black hole. Yeah. And various different theories about them, but it seems that at the moment when that when a star collapses into a black hole, uh, there's a huge burst of gamma that's produced. Okay. Well, and that also would make complete sense because, um, I mean, its nucleus is, is, is disintegrating, mm. so it's obviously going to release. You know, mm. its this energy. is nuclear radiation. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so they're, and they're, they're quite fascinating events, and apparently the most powerful event, uh, uh, events, um, uh, electromagnetic events, in any case, in the universe. Mm. Uh, and they can, they, can, they can last for a millisecond, or they can last for much longer sometimes. Uh, okay. uh, and we now know about these... So uh, those stars before, they, they just would be very, very hot before mm. they disintegrated? Very massive, aren't they really? And then they collapse. Yeah, they collapse I think that's, okay. that's why they're. This is another subject altogether. Yeah. Black holes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, so so um, uh, we're going to leave it there on this uh, intergalactic uh, image. Uh, and uh, the next talk we're going to continue exploring uh, uh, invisible lights and, uh, and the vision revolution. Uh, okay, how With Ultraviolet mm -hmm. tomorrow. Yeah, okay. ultraviolet, which is interesting because uh, some animals can see ultraviolet, but, but okay. we can't. Amazing, we're getting closer to the visible mm -hmm. area of the spectrum now, aren't we? Mm -hmm.